sitting in, in, in verses like this all week long has an effect, and um, the effect in my life was conviction. I, I was so convicted by these verses and challenged to a, a greater attentiveness, challenged to a greater uh, focus on confession, a, a, a greater fight against sin. One of the questions that struck me is, how much of my week have I spent hunting and killing sin? Am I as committed to, to the fighting against sin, to the finding it, calling it what it is, and killing it, as I am to the benefits of this life that we have, this, this forgiveness that we have? You see, it's one thing to celebrate forgiveness, but there, the, the, the celebration of forgiveness is like opening the, 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 the door into the work of freedom. We have been forgiven that we might be holy. We've been set free from sin, not to live in it, but to go after it and hunt it down in our lives and put it to death. And I think in my life, at least, I felt this week that there is not the, not the attentiveness as there ought to be. There is more purpose, more intention, more strategy, more hunting and killing needed. And uh, it's my prayer that as we move through these verses, you will feel a, a fire for that, uh, the weight and the importance of it, but also the joy of it. We can do this, my friends. We can do this. As Christians, this is our occupation. This is what we do. We strive for holiness. Strive for it. And this is our opportunity today. So let's get into these verses. Hope that produces holiness. Hope that produces holiness. This is the flow. And it's as if Peter says, listen, this hope, this hope is, is, is what everything hinges upon. So put all of the weight of these charges that he gives us, really, they carry through the rest of this book. Through all of the rest of 1 Peter comes command, command, command. And he hinges all of those on the reality of the gospel, the accomplishments that we have from our Father in the Son, Jesus Christ, and the hope that awaits us. Look at how this goes. This is where we left off, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope, Christian, fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where we left off two weeks ago. Set your hope. Fix it. Get, get, get focused on what is awaiting you. And if you do that, something's going to happen in your life. There is a transforming work that will inevitably take place if you have your hope fixed as it ought to be. Anticipation leads to sanctification. Anticipation leads to sanctification. If one of the struggles of your life is you're not being sanctified, you're not growing in godliness, you don't feel like you're progressing and, and moving into a greater realization of, of the character of Christ, one of the missing elements may indeed be hope. Hope. It is the foundation upon which you stand as you run into godliness by the strength of the Lord. So anticipation leads us into sanctification. Let's start here with verses 14 to 16. I titled this, The Call to Holiness. So the first command of 1 Peter is set your hope, fix your hope. And then a whole host of commands flow out of that. The very next one is the call to holiness. <clears throat> As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Okay, so he meets us as believers, and he calls us to something very distinct. We're called out of the dark, we're called out of the world, and we're called into obedience. As obedient children. Now, I was just struck by that. Why would he say it that way? What do we have here? Obedient children. We were, by nature, Paul says, children of wrath, right? Like the rest of mankind, we were children of wrath. In John chapter 8, Jesus calls the Pharisees 
children of Satan, right? So think of this. You are of your father, the devil, he says. So when we are sinners, when we are railing against God, when we are running in the dark with all of our might, we are children of wrath. We are not reflecting the image of our creator, are we? We, we are dragging that image through the mud. But as believers, we now have a father. We have a father who calls us to obedience. And so we are now children of God. We are seated at the table. We've been brought into the family. We're children. And I think Peter here is drawing on this concept of, of children are to look like the one they come from. Right? There's a likeness that's shared here. That image of God is to echo into our lives. We should look like the one who saved us. Beloved, John says it this way in, in 1 John 3, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. There's the hope. Look at the connection. It's amazing how similar the Word of God is across the different writers. Hope that leads to holiness. Watch this. We are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him. We anticipate that because we shall see him as he is. So what do we do while we wait? And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he, Christ, is pure. So we lock eyes with our Savior. We see him for who he is, and we say, I want to be like him. He's coming again, and while I wait, while I anticipate his return, I want more and more to be conformed to his likeness. I want to be Christ-like in my character, in my words, in my thoughts, in my deeds, the things I don't do, the things I do. I want to be like Jesus. If we were basketball players and we had a, a hero basketball player, what would you do? You would study him. How does he dribble the ball? What does he do? What does he not do? What does he eat? How does he prepare for a game? How does he, you're looking at every aspect of his life because you want to what? You want to emulate him. You want to be like Mike. Whether than when I was a kid, 23, man, that was our guy. I remember out there on the basketball court in the driveway, I would watch games uh, Sunday afternoon and then I would go out and I would try to dribble like that and and do the tricks and the things, because I wanted to be like the one that I esteemed most on the basketball court. The person we lock eyes with in Jesus Christ is the person who is to be in us, increasingly displayed in our lives. Everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. He is Without sin. That is our longing. Rejecting the passions of our former ignorance. This is something that speaks to the transformation at work in us. We once lived without a thought of this. We, we didn't have a standard of holiness that we were aiming for. We, we wanted to be sovereign. We did whatever we wanted. The passions of our former ignorance. We were in the dark. Friend, now through Christ, you are in the light. You have eyes to see. You, you, you see clearly, and you are set free to obey then. It reminds me of Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves, Paul says, we were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That's the deeds of darkness. That's the, the bad fruit, the corrupt and evil fruit that we once lived in, and, and it was normal. But now in Christ, we've been called out of that. So don't conform. Don't allow your former ignorance, these passions that once ruled your life, don't allow them to press in on you and shape you and form you. Reject them. Reject them. Ephesians 5, 7, and 8. I love these verses. We talked about these on Wednesday. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. That is sinners. That is the world. For at one time you were, not, not you were in. I love how Paul says this. At one time you were darkness. We, we were darkness, 
evil, sin, corruption. That's who we were. But now you are light. Not, you're not just in light. You are light. It's who you are. It's your essence. It's the deepest, most truest thing of you. It's, it's the righteousness of Christ. You are light in the Lord. So how should we walk? How should we live? What does it look like on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the week long? Walk as children of the light. Hmm. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. We live in evil days. We live in a culture that is corrupt and defined by sin and pressing in on us. And if we are not intentional, we will be shaped into the mold of godlessness. Godliness is not something hap that happens in your life passively. It's not just going to occur. It is call. It's called forth in the Word. You are called to godliness. Put to death. Kill, mortify the deeds of the flesh. This is a command. These are commands we're called to obey and follow. Now we do so by the strength of the Lord. And we lean upon His grace in all of our desire and longing to be right in Him and, and, and righteous and, and obedient to Him. Walk as children of the light. So, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your for, former ignorance, but what, what should we do? So that's what we should not do. Don't be conformed. Reject the mold. <clears throat> but as he who called you is holy, there's the standard, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now you remember when we were in Leviticus? I always have it over here because this is where we kind of imagined the altars. All of those sacrifices took place over here. In Leviticus, what was the reason for the call of God's people to be set apart, to be not like the nations all around them, but to be set apart or holy unto the Lord? What was the basis of that? Every time, over and over and over, because I am holy, God says, you are to be holy. Be like me. I am holy. This is who I am. I have brought you out of slavery and into this land, and you now are to be reflectors of my likeness in this dark world. This is the Great Commission. You realize the Great Commission is not simply about conversion. It's about holiness. Fill the earth with the glory of God. That is the call. So yes, conversion is critically important, and that is why we preach the gospel in evangelism, but we don't stop there. Listen to the commission. Go to the ends of the earth, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to what? To obey, to observe all that I have commanded you. Holiness is the goal of evangelism. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Is that, a, is that a command to steal away our joy? Does God call us to holiness because He knows that if we're not holy, we're just going to be more happy? D does He think that, that His rules for us are just going to be burdensome? Is God a killjoy? Know this, friends. His commands are His love. He's calling us out of slavery and futility in the dark into light and satisfying righteousness. There is nothing more delightful than holiness, Christian. Let me just say this again. We all need to hear this. I preach this to myself. Pastor Jeremy, there is nothing more delightful than holiness. Believe that this week. And strive for it with every fiber of your being. Strive for the holiness apart from which no one will see the Lord. We must strive for holiness. It's who we are. It's what we've been enabled to do and called by God to do. You shall be holy for I am holy. 
The call to holiness in our lives involves two things. It involves a separation from evil. We have been set apart, called out of the dark into the marvelous light. That's chapter 2, verse 9. We're going to get there in a little while. So separate yourself from evil. Now, this is the challenge for us because the world, the flesh, and the devil, these are our great enemies. The world is a system of sin. You, you can't fully separate yourself from that system, but you can be distinct, a light in the dark, right? We're, we don't build monasteries and try to escape the world because we have been sent into the world to what? To shine like a city on a hill, to shine into the dark. So we shine best when we are set apart from the dark. The, the light that is shrouded in darkness or covered up will not shine, but a distinct light is bright. It pierces the darkness. This is the call. But that's not enough. The, the call moves beyond that. It's, a, it's not just a separation from evil, but a dedication to righteousness. It's really the, the, the best defense is a good offense in this case. If you want to kill sin in your life, love righteousness. Pray to that end. This is another thing we need to add into our prayers more. Oh, that the, 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 the percentage of our prayers that revolve around confession and longing for holiness would increase. That's what we need, more. So look at your prayer life this past week. How, what, what percentage of your praying this past week was made up of confession and grief and, and sorrow for sin and longing and striving for holiness? Lord, help me love you and your ways and your light and righteousness more. I want to love it more than any darkness can offer me that that would increase in our lives so that week by week we would see this, this movement toward holiness purposefully, answered prayers. If you're battling with a, a, a besetting sin that you just keep struggling with and you just keep finding yourself in this sin, here's what you need to do. Pray. Lord, stir in me a greater desire for the satisfying reality of holiness than anything sin could ever offer me. The fleeting pleasures of sin, oh, they're momentary. It's like holding a match up to the sun. Which is brighter? The match is burning out. It's gone. It burns your fingers as well. Take the sun all day. I want the sun of your righteousness, satisfying holiness. There is victory. There is triumph over any sin in this life. That's the reality that we have. That's the power of the gospel. There is nothing, no substance, no, no, no temptation that is taken upon you that, that the power of God cannot shatter. May the Lord increase our longing for holiness. And pray to that end. Separated from evil, Lord, I do not want darkness. I do not want sin. And in addition to that, I love righteousness. I love obedience. I delight in the satisfaction of all of the pleasures that you provide. Be my satisfying joy. John Owen said it this way, Christian, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Right? There's no coasting in the Christian life. The Christian life is war. It's war. It's war against you, right? So the world, the flesh, and the enemy, the devil. He can only tempt. It is the greatest enemy that you see when you look in the mirror the old you that would like to rise up out of the grave and lead you into sin, you are free to say no to sin now. You don't have to sin anymore. When we sin, we choose to sin. And let's be clear, there's no one in this room that is yet 100% free from sin. Someday, that's coming. 
That's why the Christian life is war. We fight to kill sin. We go after it. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Put to death. Mortify is the word. Kill it. Put to death, Christian, therefore what is earthly in you. That is those, those, those deeds that you once walked in, in your former ignorance. Okay, here it is. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. Note that the first four all deal in kind of a similar category, don't they? Do you think that the struggles that we face in this world of of pornography and impurity and adultery and lust and temptation. You think those are new? These are not new struggles. These are age-old struggles tempted by the tempter himself to trip up Christians. In some ways, it's not as bad in our day as it was back then when you were trying to walk down the road and you walk past a pagan temple where out in the open there's public Horrible acts taking place in view, full view, and they called it worship. Put it to death, Christian. Put it to think. Paul is writing this in this context to people who worshiped in that way, pagan idolaters. And he says, come away from that into a far more satisfying reality. Put it to death. Evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Now he moves to maybe the more respectable, challenging things, right? Anger, wrath. These are the struggles of internal sin. Malice and slander, obscene talk from your mouth, which really is about self-control. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its evil practices, and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after its creator, after the image of its creator. What is likeness, right? Was to be like the Father, look like the Father in the inside and the outside. So put off, mortify, kill, crucify the old passions, the old inclinations, and in addition to that, put on, replace them, Crowd out the old with far greater realities of the new. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Oh, what wonderfully encouraging words. You are chosen, you are holy, positionally holy in Christ, and you are loved. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, Bearing with one another, and if any has a a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now let me ask the question. Did anyone here walk in with a hard heart towards someone? Did anyone today walk in this room and say, I will never forgive this person for what they did? Then let me love you with this very clear and straightforward command. You're in sin. You are called to forgive as you have been forgiven. So also you must forgive. The unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron. It's a denial of the very grace that we have been defined by when we refuse to show it. Forgive. Love. Above all, put put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The reason I include this list is because I want want us to be specific. We're not not just talking generally here. This This is like specific things that you need to be hunting and killing and then seeking and praying, Lord, grow me in these things. Help me to be more kind. Help me to be more compassionate. Help me to be quicker to humility and and meekness and help me to forgive. Right? These are These are the fruits of the Spirit that are built out as we pursue and seek to obey the Lord. I like how Kevin DeYoung put it. By the way, if you've never read this book, this is a great book for your Christmas break. Uh, It's not long. It's called The Whole in Our Holiness. uh, I think it's only like 10 bucks on Amazon or something like that. 
Uh, it is spectacular. It's my favorite book on the topic. Listen now, he says it. Christians work. They work to kill sin, and they work to live in the Spirit. They have rest in the gospel. Absolutely, yes. But they never rest in their battle against the flesh and the devil. The child of God has two great marks about him. He is known for his inner warfare and his inner peace. This is to be true of us, increasingly so as we grow and mature in Christ. The closer we are to Christ, the more we should hate our sin. The more we hate our sin, the more the gospel reassures us of victory over it and the joy and peace that comes as we confess it and we are washed from it. They go hand in hand. This is our work, Christian. Are you at war? Are you at war with you, with your sin? I was not satisfied with my war effort when I surveyed my life this past week. I was completely dissatisfied with the intentionality and the prayer needed to be at war with me. This sermon was helpful for me. The second category we're going to look at here is the cost of our ransom. So the call to holiness is followed then by the cost of our ransom. And I want, I want you to see what we just sang before this sermon is, is how Peter thinks as well. When you think about the call to holiness, think about the cross and the price Jesus paid. Look at what he says in verse 17. And if you call on him as Father, who, by the way, judges impartially according to each one's deeds, then conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now, you see the theme of exile come up again. This is, this is going back to the very first words that we saw. Remember, elect exiles, that is, chosen and rejected, chosen by God, rejected by the world. We are in exile in this world. Um, you could say it this way. The world is not going to be applauding your effort to grow in holiness. Much the opposite. The world will be disturbed by it, not impressed. The world will be convicted by it. The world is not going to be like, man, what, what an awesome group of people over at Good Shepherd. They are serious about their sin. They, they are going after holiness with all their might. That's not going to happen. We are in exile. We are aliens, strangers. We are those who have been rejected by the world. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. So was Jesus. So was Jesus. Our mission is not to try to be applauded or patted on the back or to be celebrated by the world. Oh, how many churches have gone off the rails with that as a desire. What we believe, what we teach, what we hold true to will increasingly be hated by the world. We are in exile. How are we to live? Well, we are to live with fear. What does that mean? Well, there are two ways to live the Christian life. One is to handle grace cheaply. The other is to live in the fear of the Lord. There's a young man that I heard about recently who decided to uh, have his girlfriend move into the place where he's living. This young man grew up in the church. He would say that he is a believer. And yet, he has decided to invite sin into his home by living with a woman who is not his wife. This is clearly wrong. The Bible makes it extremely clear that it's wrong. And every morning this young man wakes up with this woman in his bed. He invites the displeasure of God for his sin. Is he saved? That's a question this young man should be asking. Because Christians don't choose to settle in and live in sin like that. 
You ask, well, what would he say if, if you confronted him? Well, he would probably say, God will forgive me. God will forgive me. It's no big deal. He forgives sin. I'm a Christian. It's not that big a deal. Is that what the cross says? It's not that big a deal? The fear of the Lord says sin required the cross. Sin is a huge deal. We don't cheapen grace. We don't just be, oh, I'll do whatever I want. And God will forgive me. My fear for those who would live there long is that indeed they are not saved. They have been playing games. A life defined by the dark cannot claim to love the light. So if you're here today and that is you, then I love you enough to say, be warned. Hell awaits those who love to live in the dark, even those who have a fish on their bumper. If your life is defined by the deeds of darkness, you are not showing forth that indeed your Father is God. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees, basically. Instead, we are to walk in the fear of the Lord. We will answer for all that we have done in the body. You remember this, Christians even as well. The judgment seat of Christ is coming. The books will be opened. We will answer for all. Every careless word, it says in Matthew, is recorded and answered. We will answer for this, not in wrath, because the wrath is paid in full, but every sin matters in the Christian life. We are accountable to the God who has saved us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. By the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Look at the call here. The wisdom that overflows in these pages. The fear of the Lord is clean. Oh, it's not a killjoy. It is satisfying to live in the fear of the Lord. It endures forever. The rules of the Lord are true. They're true. They're righteous altogether. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, not justifying of it, not explaining it away, not minimizing it, not trying to, to coddle it or create space for it, but to go to war with your sin is the fear of the Lord. This is the call of the Christian life. We don't excuse patterns of sin because, well, that's what our family does. No. The call is holy, and so we go to war with those sins. We don't write it off, well, this is, I just reacted because of your sin. No, 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 no. Our sin is never justified when we are sinned against. Just because just someone else sins against you doesn't mean that you have a right to sin. Never, Christian. The list goes on. This is a big, this is a big work. This takes, this takes a lifetime of labor and tenacious, persevering love for Christ, walking in the fear of the Lord. We live before the face of God. He knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows our words. He sees everything. We are accountable to Him. If you call on him as Father who judges impartially, Peter says, according to each one's deeds, then conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now look how he points. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited by your, from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So don't, don't settle for the sins of your family tree. Don't excuse your sin because, well, that's what my dad did when he got upset. Or that's what I saw my grandpa do when he didn't like what my grandma said or did. Right? You see how this, this, this inherited inclination to sin or how easy it is to justify sin because of this. No, that's not our likeness anymore. 
Who is the one we are to echo, to be like we are to be like our Father? Because the blood of Christ has been shed. The cross of Christ and the clarity of sin. I was trying to find the quote. I think it was John Stott who said, the closer you are to the cross of Christ, the more clearly you see how heinous and horrible your sin is. Now, I don't say this to to cause your head to hang low today, Christian. I don't say this to steal your joy. I say this to release it, to free your joy. There is a an awareness of our sin that can come only as we are close to the cross, when we hear the nails pound into His hands and feet, when we hear Him cry, when we hear the screams and the sorrow and we see the blood run down and we realize He did that because I sin. Do you think He did that so that I would just live in sin? And go to heaven. He died on the cross to release me from sin. To no longer live in it. That is joy. So stand near the cross, Christian. It's one of the benefits of the table. That's why it's so good that we come often. Remember again. Why is sin such a big deal? Because God is holy. God is holy. And we are to be holy as well. We've been ransomed from futility, senselessness, foolishness. We used to run in this darkness, tripping over everything. We didn't even know what we were doing. We were in the dark. We're fumbling around, crashing into stuff. No, no longer. Why would we live in the dark? The light is shining in our hearts. We've been ransomed with the precious blood of our Savior who was without sin. He is the the person that we seek to be like. He is the example. What does it look like to live in this fallen, dark, messed up, sinful world and obey the Father? Look at the Son. Look at the Son and consider. He did it. And so can we. We can obey. The cross not only is the accomplishment of our forgiveness, but is, it is the accomplishment of our freedom from sin. We, we can say no to sin because Jesus conquered. That is the call. A lot of it comes down to treasuring Christ. What, what you find often in the Christian life is that when you sin, you just, you just choose, you choose what you want more. You're free. You don't have to choose sin. And so what happens is you realize that that, that deeds, what you do, flows out of what you desire. And in order to deal with, with sin, you have to go to the level of desire. You have to ask yourself, why did I want that? Why did I respond that way? Well, because I, I, I still believe somehow that there is a right or, or something, something of that response is more satisfying than what would be right and righteous. And that desire has to be addressed by the truth of God's Word. This is why renewing our minds, Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? How are we transformed? By the renewal of the mind so that we think right thoughts and those thoughts inform new desires that are true and rooted in righteousness and out of those desires then comes actions in keeping with repentance. Actions that would be honoring to the Lord. Treasuring Christ is at the heart of it. Who do I love most? If you treasure Christ, you are going to hate sin. To treasure Christ is to hate your sin. To see your sin as He sees your sin. To to see that it cost Christ His life so that you could be forgiven and set free from sin. Now let's finish with these two verses, the confidence of our hope, the confidence of our hope. Verses 20 and 21. He, that is Jesus, 
was foreknown, or you might say forechosen, for loved, all of those, as we saw at the beginning, they all flow together, foreknown, for chosen, for loved, before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. What's Peter doing here? What's, Peter, what's he doing? Well, he's pointing us back to the gospel. He's, he's circling back to where he started. He's coming back to hope. The, the whole confidence that we have is it's not in us. Oh, how easy it is to just lose yourself in just raw willpower. I will be holy. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna be holy. Give it time. You prove, you prove yourself wrong. You'll be right back there with all those in Leviticus with another sacrifice. But that's not where we are anymore. We're not bringing another lamb because we did it again. We failed. We sinned. We rebelled. No. Where are we? We're New Testament Christians. We have the gospel, the once for all sacrifice for sin. We are forgiven categorically in Christ. We are positionally righteous, progressing in righteousness, and someday we will be perfect in righteousness. It's the gospel that meets us with confidence. Hope, we can do this. It's not just willpower. It's gospel power that brings us all the way home, that washes us and makes us righteous. This is a Christ-centered confidence and a Christ-centered transformation. He's the focus, right? It just calls us back to this passage in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin. This is the call to holiness in Hebrews. The sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance, Christian. This is the making of war on your sin. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't let up. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. How do we run? Where do we look? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. He is, by the way, the one who founded the work and the one who will finish the work. He's the one who's going to bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. And he is the one who fulfilled the will of God the Father who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. There's hope. There's hope. He's not dead. He's alive and he's coming. We can do this. We can do this. One of the encouragements I would give you is this. If you, if you feel yourself condemned by sin, if you, if, if you wake up and you're just like this 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 movement of pride flows through your heart and you see it and you catch it and it just discourages you. Let me encourage you with this. This work is a marathon work. It's a marathon work. You might not notice transformation if you're looking day by day. Pull back though. Pull back and look month by month. Look year Lord, how are you growing me? How are you refining me? How have I grown in righteousness? How am I increasingly like Christ? And you will begin to see change. You will begin to see growth. This is, this is a, a lifelong work, but it takes tenacity. It takes intentionality. I like how Kevin DeYoung said it. He said, Trusting, yes, but trusting is not alone. Trusting leads to trying. Trusting leads to trying. It's, it's effort. It's labor. It's crucify, put to death, fight, kill, bring to life righteousness. All of this is by His grace. The sin-slaying power of the gospel it's not just yours to save you from your sins, 
through all eternity. It is yours to free you from your sins today. It's the power of the gospel. And it's the call of Peter here for us as we run this race. Our response this morning, just ask the question, are you striving to grow in holiness? Striving like a runner in a race, a long marathon, leaning forward, striving. Is this a goal for your walk with the Lord? If not, put it on the radar. This is Christianity 101. I want to be holy, oh God. Make me increasingly holy. Help me love holiness. Help me look to Christ more. Help me breathe the air of the gospel. Help me hunt and kill sin this week. Let's go. Let's go to war. First John chapter 1, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. I just want to ask if you're in that category today. I love the Lord. I, I love Jesus. But your life this past week denies that claim. I love the light. I absolutely love coming to church. I love the light. But your life all week long says that you actually love the dark. It's dangerously possible to come to church week after week after week and lie to yourself when it comes to a love for Christ. Do you love Him? If you do, you're going to hate your sin and you're going to want to kill it in His power. So if you're here today and your life is defined by the dark, then be honest with yourself. You need light. And there's good news because the light is here and His name is Jesus and He saves sinners like all of us here in this room. He saves sinners. So stop lying to yourself. Be honest. I need to be saved. That may be you today. You might be here in the next verse. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You might be saying the opposite. <laughs> what do you mean saved? Saved from sin? I haven't killed anybody. I'm not that bad of a person. I haven't done any horrible things. If you're here, and your heart is beating, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You are not holy. God is the standard, not the people around you. He sets the bar, and the bar is what? Perfection. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever lusted after a woman? Have you ever taken something that's not yours? Have you ever misused the name of the Lord? What would Ray Comfort say? So you're telling me you're a good person, but you're a liar, you're a blasphemer, you're an adulterer, and uh, what was the other? And a thief, and you're a good person. That, you see, it doesn't add up. We are all of us sinners. We all need Christ as Savior. What is the call? Come to the Savior. Come, be forgiven and set free. He's the Savior of only sinners. Good people are never saved by Jesus Christ. They are sentenced to the fires of hell because there is no one good. You have to call out for the doctor and his name is Jesus. We are all of us in need. He can save to the utmost. Here is one of the most amazing promises of your Bible. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, righteous, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, as believers, this is every day. This is all week long. 1 John 1, 9 is the air we breathe because we still sin. This is, this is where we live day by day. Call it what it is. I turn from it. Lord, I lay it at your feet. I find forgiveness in Jesus. Thank you for your forgiveness. Now let's go to war. I don't want to do that again. Let's fight and win. Bring some along with you in this. This is not an individual work. Share with others your desire for victory on the battlefield and go to war together. 
in the power of the Lord. And close with a quote from Kevin DeYoung here. The Bible is realistic about holiness. Don't think all this glorious talk about dying to sin and living to God means there is no struggle anymore or that sin will never show up in the believer's life. The Christian life still entails obedience. It involves a fight, but it's a fight we will win. You have the Spirit of Christ in your corner. He's rubbing your shoulders. He's holding the bucket. He's putting his arm around you and saying before the next round, you're going to knock him out, kid. Think of this, the Holy Spirit in you. It's the power and presence of God in your life for the purpose of killing sin. What resource you have, believer, in this work. Don't be discouraged. Don't be condemned. Be energized to go to war. Sin may get in some good jabs. It may clean your clock once in a while. It may bring you to your knees. But if you are in Christ, it will never knock you out. You are no longer a slave, but free. Sin has no dominion over you. It can't. It won't. A new king sits on the throne. You serve a different master. You salute a different lord. So we end where we began. Hope Hope. We will win this fight. There is hope, Christian. We're going to win this fight. Someday we will look back on these years of warfare against the sin in our lives, and we will look back from a position of perfect holiness. No more sin. Praise God. That is our future. It's coming. So while we wait, we war. We fight in His strength. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we pray that you would make this true of all of us all the more this week. Thank you for your love, your love that would convict us of our sin, your love that would show us hard hearts, that, 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 that would call out our justification or minimizing of horrible sin. Help, help us to see it and hate it like you do, O oh Lord, and then help us to go to war in the power of the gospel and find victory. May we be, O oh God, increasingly so, a holy people, because you are holy. Help us. Give us this joy, this, 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 this belief that, that obedience to you is far more satisfying than anything the world would hold out, or the echo of our old corrupt self would would lead us into. We choose you, Lord. We choose righteousness. We choose obedience today. We depend upon you and we pray in your grace that you would empower us to fight. Fight this good fight until we meet you face to face and enjoy the, the perfection of sinlessness forever through the victory of our Savior Jesus. We honor you in this, Lord, and we ask for your help. We cannot do this on our own. And so we look to you and we pray, make us holy, O oh God. More this day than last. More this week than last week. More this month than last month. More as we head into this new year, more tenacious for obedience and holiness. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.